السلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيبه إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا ابن رسول الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا مظلوم يا شهيد يا غريب يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قد أوهنت جلد الديار الخالية من أهلها مال الديار ومالها ومتى سألت الدار عن أربابها يعد الصدى من ورد الحسين إلى العراق وظنهم تركوا النفاق إذ العراق كما هي ولقد دعوه للعنا فأجابهم ودعاهم لهدى فردوا داعيا داعيا ماذا طعم فراتهم حتى قضى عطشا فغسل بالدماء القانية سيدي أبا عبد الله سيدي تبكيك عيني لا لأجل مثوبة لكنما عيني لأجلك باكية يا تبتل منكم كربلا بدم ولا تبتل مني بالدموع جارية أنست رزيتكم رزايانا التي سلفت وهونت الرزايا الآتية 
وفجائع الأيام تبقى مدة وتزول وهي إلى القيامة باقية يا دار أنشدك على أهاليك يا دار أنشدك على أهاليك يا دار وين حسين راعيك كم وافد وقاصد ينفيك وين البطل عباس حاجيك لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن ورائهم برزخ إلى يوم يبعثون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد الثاني على حب الحسن والحسين Third salawat for the love of Fatima to Zahra with your loudest voices. Last night we began on a journey discussing the stages and the stages of the hereafter. Inshallah, all of you slept well last night. And tonight we continue that journey, inshallah. As a recap, last night we discussed what happens to us from the moment that we die. We discussed two main stages and stations. We said that the stages and the stations of the hereafter are four. Last night we discussed two, and inshallah tonight we discussed two. The stages that we talked about last night were death and its obstacles, we mentioned two, Sakratul Maut, the intoxication of death, and Al Adil and Al Maut, switching faith at the time of death. And we talked about, that was the first stage. The second stage and station that we talked about was the grave. And we also talked about two obstacles of the grave. Number one, the fear and loneliness. And number two, I'm sorry, we talked about three obstacles. Number one, the fear and loneliness, number two, being squeezed, and number three, the interrogation of Munka and Nakir. Tonight, inshallah, we'll talk about the other stages, beginning with the third stage, the third station, Alam al Barzakh. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Alam al Barzakh is a transitional stage. It's a transitional period in between this life and the Day of Judgment. What happens to us after we are buried, up to the moment of resurrection, this is called Alamin Barzakh. We have a hadith that say souls are of two kinds. The souls of the believers, the souls of the mu'mineen will all go to Wadi Salam in Najaf al Wherever you're buried, it doesn't matter. Whether you're buried in London, or in the United States, or in Pakistan, or in Afghanistan, your body remains there, but your soul comes to Wadi Salam in Najaf al Sometimes Amir al Mu'mini would be seen by his companion speaking to souls. Speaking. He would tell him, Ya Amir al Mu'mini, who are you speaking to? He says, These are the souls of the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them, transports their souls to hear Wadi Salam in Amin. This is the souls of the believers. As for the souls of the kuffar and mushrikeen and disbelievers, they go to a place called Wadi Barahut or Wadi Barahut in Yemen. In Yemen there's an area called Wadi Barahut. Their souls go over there. 
Now, of course, these souls in Alam al-Barzakh, Alam al-Barzakh is, is either a pre-heaven or a pre-hell. For the believers, they're being rewarded. They're having a good time. But it's not necessarily in heaven, it's in Wadi Salam. But they're having a good time. Here. As for the souls of disbelievers, no, they're being tormented. And they're being punished in Wadi Barahud. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad Wadi Muhammad. Now what are these souls doing? The souls that go to Wadi Salam, the good souls. And the bad souls that go to Wadi Barahut, what do these souls do? Are they engaged in certain actions and certain activities? Are they waiting for something? Rasulullah answers. He says, Give, pass on deeds to your dead, the souls of your dead. Because in Alam al Barzakh, in this transitional period, they're waiting for their family members to send them good deeds. Whether it's sadaqah or salah, recitation of the Holy Quran, a dua, seeking forgiveness for them, they're waiting for them. He says, اِهْدُوا لِمَوْتَاكُمْ قَالُوا وَمَا هِيَ الْهَدِيَ لِلْأَمْوَاتِ They ask him, Ya Rasulullah, you tell us to give to our dead. What do we give them? What is it exactly that we give them? قَالْ الصَّدَقَةُ وَالدُّعَاءُ You give sadaqah and that reward, you send it to them. You ask Allah, you say, you tell Allah that this thawam that I have received, I want it to go to such and such person. Send it to them. وَالدُّعَاءُ Pray for them. Pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases in their reward, forgives them, has mercy upon them. This is very important. And then he says, Ya ahli, wa ya wildi, wa ya abi, wa ya ummi, wa ya aqribai, i'tufu alayna billadhi kana fi aydina, wal waylu wal hisab alayna, wal manfa'atu li ghayrina. I'tufu alayna bidirham, aw bi raqif, aw bi kiswatin yaksukum Allah, min libas al jannah, thumma baka al nabi, wa baka al ashar. Rasulullah stated that every Friday, the souls come to their homes. If you have someone from your family members that passed away, every Friday they come back. They come back, they don't enter inside, so you don't need to panic and worry. They come and stand on the roof, and, it's as if, and, and they say, but obviously we can't hear them. They say, my family members, my parents, my children, my wife, my husband, have some mercy upon us. Remember us. Remember us by giving a loaf of bread to the poor and send the thawab to us. Give sadaqah to the poor and send the thawab to us. Remember us with a dua, a recitation of the Holy Quran, anything, remember us. The dead are in need because their relationship with this life is over. Tell us. Once they depart from this life, they can't perform any more good deeds. They have no good actions, only the ones that they performed here. Thus, when they go to that life, they realize that their good deeds are not enough. And their bad deeds are too many. So they depend on whom? On their relatives in this life. That is why whenever you see, and this is something well known, that if you ever you see a relative that has passed away in your dream, most of the time, they come to your dream to tell you, do good deeds for us. Send us something. Recite Surah Al-Fatiha, recite Surah Yasin, especially Thursday nights. Thursday nights, the souls await for their family members to send them good deeds. 
And then after Rasulullah said this hadith, he began crying, and his companions began crying as well. And in another hadith, Rasulullah states that a a son or a daughter, they might be good to their parents in their lifetime. You might be good to your parents, you obey them, you respect them. You are considered barrin walidain. You're righteous and you're good to your parents. However, when they die, you don't seek forgiveness for them. You don't pray for them. You don't send them good deeds. Allah will turn you from barrin walidain into aqin walidain. And to someone who is disrespectful and disobedient to his parents. Why? Because when they die, you forgot about them. See, when we die, brothers and sisters, what dies is this physical body. But the spirit is there. The spirit is still there. Just because a human being dies, it doesn't mean that we cut off all of our ties and relationship with that human being. Absolutely not. That human being, his soul, his soul still exists. His spirit still exists. And they're in need. And on the contrary, Rasulullah says that if a human being was bad to his parents during his lifetime, during their lifetime. He disrespected them. He disobeyed them. And Allah had made him, had ridden him as Aqil Walidin. Someone bad to his parents. But after their death, he sought forgiveness for them. He prayed for them. He sent them good deeds and donated the thawab and the rewards for them. Allah will turn him from Aqil Walidin to Barul Walidin. أن العبد لا يكون بارا بوالدي في حياتهما ثم يموتان فلا يقضي عنهما دينهما. They have a debt. They're in debt. He doesn't go pay it off. His father dies, and he had a five thousand pound debt, a ten thousand pound debt. Go pay it off. He doesn't. ولا يستغفر لهما فيكتبه الله عاقا. وأنه لا يكون عاقا لهما في حياتهما. غير بار بهما فإذا مات طبع دينهما واستغفر لهما فيكتبه الله بارا thus the dead are in need even when they're there they're waiting for you to send them something seek forgiveness for them that is why it's very important to pray for your parents whether they're dead or alive وقل رب ارحمهما رب اغفر لي ولوالدي Oh Allah, forgive me and forgive my parents. This is the best du'a that you can pray for your parents. Pray for them. Pray that, pray that Allah forgives their sins. وَرْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا And have mercy upon them the same way that they raised me as I was a child. Thus it's very important that if a parent, a mother, a father dies, if they had salah that they didn't pray, if there is psalm that they didn't fast, if they didn't go to hajj, if there are certain things that they didn't do, religious obligations that they didn't carry out, it becomes your responsibility. It becomes your responsibility. And we'll talk about that perhaps tomorrow night, inshallah. One of the responsibilities of children is that if their parents had religious duties that they did not carry out, they have to do it for them. This was the third stage. The third station. As for the four, fourth station, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Wali. The fourth station is the Day of Judgment. And this station is a very long station. And there's many stations and obstacles within this major station. The station of the Day of Judgment. ثَقُلَتْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا تَأْتِيكُمْ إِلَّا بَغْتَةً The Day of Judgment comes as a surprise. It comes as a surprise. All of a sudden, we are told, this is the Day of Judgment. It has been mentioned that Rasulullah, إِذَا ذُكِرَ السَّاعَةِ اشْتَدَّ صَوْتُهُ وَحْمَرَّتْ وَجِنَاتُهُ When Rasulullah would remember the Day of Judgment, or someone would mention the Day of Judgment in front of Rasulullah, Rasulullah's voice would thicken. Have you seen someone who's about to cry? Their, fo their voice changes, it becomes groggy. And his 
cheeks become red because he's about to burst into tears. This is how Rasulullah would churn when he would remember the Day of Judgment. This is Rasulullah. Rasulullah, Sayyidul Kawnayn, the greatest man who ever lived. If he would remember the Day of Judgment, he would cry and he would feel fear. What would we do? What should we do? This, of course, the Day of Judgment has fear. Because the things that occur on the Day of Judgment are scary. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوَّانَ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ الْكَدَرَةِ وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَةِ وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَةِ The signs of the Day of Judgment are very scary. The hadiths say that the planets will hit, hit one another. There will be major earthquakes. The ocean will wild up. And so on and so forth. The signs of the Day of Judgment it's very scary. Who wouldn't be scared? However, as we mentioned yesterday, that every obstacle and every station has things that either make it worse or makes it better. What makes it better? What reduces the fear of the Day of Judgment? Number one, Qara'at Surah Yusuf. He who recites Surah Yusuf often. Wa Surah Al-Dukhan, Wa Surah Al-Ahqaf, Wa Surah Al-As. If you recite these chapters of the Qur'an quite often, you won't have fear of the Day of Judgment. This is one. And the Qur'an also mentions what reduces our fear of the Day of Judgment. The Qur'an says, مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ خَيْرٌ مِنْهَا وَهُمْ مِنْ فَزَحٍ يَوْمَئِذٍ آمِنُونَ He who brings with him a good deed shall have better than it, shall have a reward greater than it, and they will not have Fear of the Day of Judgment. He who brings with him a good deed. Now what is this good deed? There's so many good deeds. Imam Ali alayhi salam tells us what this good deed is. He says, Al-Hasanatu ma'rifatu al-wilaya wa hubbina ahlul bayt. Salah ala alayhi wa The good deed that takes away the fear of the Day of Judgment is the wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam. The wilaya of Ahlul Bayt and the love of Ahlul Bayt that will benefit us. What are the obstacles of the Day of Judgment? What are the checkpoints? The Day of Judgment has certain checkpoints. Imagine yourself walking along with gazillion, not million, not billion, not tr good, probably, I don't even know if gazillion is a number, but I'm sure you can imagine it's a very big number. Lots of people are there Walking and every couple of minutes they're stopped for a checkpoint. And every checkpoint has its obstacles. The first of these obstacles is coming out of out of our grave, resurrection. Al-Ba'th. <laughs> the Quran says. That one by one they will they will come out of their graves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have one of the angels blow in a horn, and everyone will come out of their grave. This is a fearful moment. It's scary. What's going to happen to us? Tell us, the day of judgment has started. It has begun. What's about to happen? What are they going to do to me? Where are they going to take me? This is very fearful. The hadith say that there are three major fearful moments for every human being. Number one, death. Number two, I'm sorry, birth. Birth is the first one. Birth is the first fearful moment for every human being because you're in a very comfortable place for nine months. It's peaceful. No one's harming you. And then after nine months, all of a sudden, you come into this world. That's why every child, when he comes into this world, cries. It's a fearful moment. Number two, death. And number two, and number three, resurrection. Al-Ba'th, coming out of your grave. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about Isa, as a reward for Isa, Allah sends him peace. But when? وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ وُلِدَ وَيَوْمَ يَمُوتْ وَيَوْمَ يُبْعَثُ حَيَّا Peace be upon him on these three times. The day he was born, the day he dies, and the day he's resurrected. Why peace? Because that person, every person is in need of peace during these three times. It's a scary moment coming out of our graves and in what sort of state? 
the hadith say that we will re leave our graves purely naked, not worrying anything, not knowing what's going to happen to us, not knowing where they're going to take us, and what shall happen, how are we going to be judged? Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam says, إِنَّ فِي الْقِيَامَةِ لَخَمْسِينَ مَوْقِفًا On the Day of Judgment, there's 50 checkpoints. There's 50 positions in which we'll have to stand and be asked. كُلُّ مَوْقِفْ أَلْفْ سَنَةً Every checkpoint will take 1,000 years. Every checkpoint will take 1,000 years. فَأَوَّلُ مَوْقِفْ الْخُرُوجُ مِنَ الْقَبْرِ The first checkpoint out of these 50 checkpoints that will take 1,000 years each is coming out of our grave. حُبِسُوا أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ عُرَاتْ جِيَا عُطَاشَ We will be standing there naked, hungry, and thirsty. And on top of that, the fear that we'll face. Thus, it's a very fearful moment. That is why Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, what does he say in Dua Abu Hamza al-Thimani? Come with me to Abba, to Dua Abu Hamza al-Thimani. Imam Zain al-Abideen says, وَمَا لِي وَمَا لِي لَا أَبْكِي وَمَا لِي لَا أَبْكِي وَلَا أَدْرِي إِلَى مَا يَكُونُ مَصِيرِي وَأَرَى نَفْسِي وقد خفقت عند رأسي أجنحة الموت وما لي لا أبكي أبكي لخروج نفسي أبكي لوحشة قبري أبكي لضيق لحدي أبكي لسؤال منكر ونكير إياي أبكي لخروجي من قبري عريانا ذليلا حاملا وزري على ظهري أنظر مرة عن يميني وأخرى عن شمالي إذ الخلائق في شأن غير شأني إمام زين عبدين عليه السلام من دعاء أبو حمزة He says why should I not cry? Why shouldn't I cry? I cry for the moment that my soul leaves my body. I cry for the moment that they put my body in his grave. I cry for the loneliness of my grave. I cry for the small space of my tomb inside my grave. I cry for the moment that they tell me to stand from my grave. I stand humiliated, naked, humble, not knowing what to do with my sins. I look to my right, I look to my left, and I see that every human being is busy with his own affairs. On the Day of Judgment, every person will be thinking about himself and herself. What's going to happen to me? No one cares about anyone else. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ wa ummihi wa abi. On the day, we don't even want to see each other. We don't want to see our own parents. Who has it the worst, brothers and sisters? Who has it the worst at the moment of resurrection? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Three people. Number one, an namam. An namam. You know what an namam is? There's no great English definition for an namam. They say it's a gossiper, but it's more than a gossiper. An namam is a person that sees two people arguing or knows that two people are in a fight. 
he'll go to the first person. He'll hear what the first person had to say about the second person. How the first person trashed the second person. He takes the snooze. He goes to the second person and he says, guess what the first person said about you. And he'll lay the news. <laughs> then he'll get news from the second person and deliver it to the first person. There's already a fight in between them. There's already fire. This person adds fuel to the fire. This person is called an imam. Namima is one of the worst sins a person can perform. Instead of trying to fix the problem between these two, he adds fuel to the fire. One day, during the time of Musa salam, there was a drought. There was no rain. And when there's no rain, plants begin to die. Animals begin to die. And people begin to die. They don't have anything to eat. So one day Musa salam, takes his companions and his tribe, Bani Israel, into the desert to pray Salat al-Istisqa. To ask Allah to bring rain. When they went, they all prayed. No rain. First day there was no rain. Second day no rain. Third day there was no rain. Allah said, why is it there? Uh, uh, Musa asked Allah, why is it there any rain? Allah told him, Ya Musa, because one of you, among those who came out in the desert and started praying, one of them is in Ammah. And as long as he's there, I'm not going to bring rain. There's no rain. Musa told the people, told them that Allah is not bringing down rain because amongst us there's an Ammah. And Allah will not bring down rain unless this person seeks forgiveness. Musa, this is interesting. Musa asked Allah, he told him, Ya Allah, who is this person? Well, point him out. Point him out, let me go tell him. Tell him it's your fault. Allah tells Musa, he says, Ya Musa, I'm punishing this person because he goes and he spreads news, because he exposes people. You want me to do the same? You want me to expose him? This is the reason why I'm punishing him. Because he spreads news and rumors and he talks about people. And I don't expose him. That night, that man realized that everyone is being punished because of him. Of course, Allah wanted him to seek forgiveness and wanted people to learn a lesson. He sought forgiveness and after a couple of days, Allah poured down the rain. Musa asked Allah, he said, Ya Allah, you didn't bring down the rain when we prayed. Now that we haven't prayed, you brought down the rain? He said, yes. And I brought down the rain because of that man. Because he came and he sought forgiveness. And he repented and we forgave him. And Allah forgave him. This is one. And Namam has it the worst on the Day of Judgment. Number two. He who looks at a woman, at a lady, that's not his sister, that's not his wife, that's not his mother or aunt. He looks at her with lust. Um, this person has it worse. And number three, Sharab al Kham. An alcoholic. Alcoholics also have it worse on the Day of Judgment. This is what harms us. But what helps us during resurrection? Muhammad wa Number one, Qadha Hajat al Mu'min. Doing a service for a fellow Muslim, for a fellow believer, a fellow mu'min, this will help you. If a mu'min comes to you and has a request, or doesn't even come to you, doesn't necessarily need to come to you, but if a mu'min has a request, or has a hajah, and you fulfill that hajah for that mu'min, Allah will fulfill a hajah for you on the day of judgment. In a hadith by Imam Sadiq, he says, مَن نَفَّسَ عَنْ مُؤْمِنٍ he who helps a mu'min, he who fulfills a request for a mu'min, Allah shall, for, shall fulfill his own request and will help him on the day of judgment and when he leaves his grave, his heart will be relaxed, he will be comforted. Allah hajat al-mu'min. We'll talk about that in the coming nights, inshallah. I have a special speech dedicated on this. Allah hajat al Number two, When you make a fellow mu'min happy, 
You bring a smile to, this, to a face of a mu'min. This will help you on the day of judgment. If you bring a smile to a face, to the face of a mu'min, Allah will bring a smile to your face on the day of judgment. If you know of a mu'min that's sad, that's depressed, that has the blues, and you make him feel better, Allah will make you feel better. Even if, even if it's by a joke. Even if you say a joke. Do you know that saying jokes to a mu'min, this has its reward? Mizah al mu'mini thawab. Saying a joke to a mu'min, bring a smile to the face of a mu'min, making him or her laugh, this has its thawab. It has a reward. Incidentally, this year we're in Hajj. I was in Hajj this year, alhamdulillah. Allah blessed us with the pilgrimage of His house. And what I like to do in Hajj, because you know, people sometimes in Hajj, they're uptight. They're too busy with the intricate laws, the detailed laws of Hajj. They want to make sure that their Hajj is perfect. They don't want to come back next year and have to, have to do their Hajj over again. So sometimes people in Hajj are extremely uptight. Anyhow, what I'd like to do sometimes is I joke around with some of the people that are in my group. And those that know me, I like practical jokes. Of course, I like to do practical jokes. I don't want practical jokes done on me. So I remember we're in Mecca. We went to visit Jabal al Nur. For those of you that have been to Mecca, Jabal al Nur is where Ra Hira is, the cave of Hira, where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would go and meditate before the advent of Islam, and that is where he received his first. Revelation, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق This is where he received it. In غار حراء in جبل النور So I was with, with my group and I was giving them the tour. I had the microphone in my hand and I told them, um, if you look on your left, so they all looked on their left, the people that were sitting on the left of the bus and the ones that were on the right of the bus, they also got up and they came on the left side to see جبل النور. I told them, if you look on your left, this is جبل النور. So they all took out their cameras and they started taking pictures of Jabal al-Nur. Once they sat down, I told them, and if you look to your right, there's a mountain. So they all looked. And the ones that were on the left, they came on the right and they wanted to see that mountain. And they took out their cameras and they started taking pictures. I said, if you, if you look on the right, uh, you see that mountain and they all started taking pictures? I told them it has absolutely no significance. <laughs> of course, not a lot of them laughed because they, all, they had to come from the left to the right. And after Umrah, after Umrah, inshallah you will all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will invite you and you'll go to Hajj inshallah. And this is a dua that you should make all the time. Allah grants you Hajj al After Umrah, you perform tawaf around the Kaaba seven times. And you perform sa'i in between Safa and Marwa seven times. So after we finish our a'mal, after we finish the sa'i, you have to cut some of your hair. This is called taqsir. You have to cut some of your hair. And I remember, I remember some of the people in our, in our group, they were really upset of the way they were strangled and, and tawaf and squeezed in tawaf and the long walk inside. Anyhow, so when I told them to cut their hair off, some of them, they came and asked me, uh, what do we do with the hair? So I'm like, okay, this is a good time for a joke. So I told them, uh, you have to eat it. <laughs> I said, are you serious? I said, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> One of the ladies actually came and said, Say, what is the niya for that? What is the niya for eating our hair? Idkhal al-surur ala qalb al-mu'min Making a smile, uh, making a mu'min smile from time to time, this has its tawaf. Salah ala Muhammad wa alayhi. The second obstacle in the Day of Judgment after Resurrection is weighing our deeds. Al-Mizan, the scale. There's a scale ahead of us. And this is a literal scale, a real scale, in which our good deeds will be weighed and our bad deeds will be weighed. All of us. The Quran says, وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْحَقِّ If you think it's a joke, if you think it's metaphoric, if you think it's not real, the Quran says, وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْحَقِّ It's real, there's a scale. 
our good deeds will be weighed and our bad deeds will be weighed. فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ He who his good deeds are heavier than his bad deeds, these people are in good shape. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسْرُوا الْمُفْلِحُونَ And as for those that their bad deeds were more than their good deeds, these people have laws. خَلَصْ This is a bad position for them. Now what are the deeds that make our good de what are the deeds that make the good side of the scale heavier? The hadith says that the best the best deed and the heaviest deed you want to make that scale heavier? You want to add more? Imam Salih tells us what it is. He says, Ma fil mizani shayun athqal min al salati ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There's nothing heavier, no act, no statement heavier on the scale more than sending your peace of blessings upon Rasulullah and and whom? And his family. And his family. Because when you just send on the Prophet, you're cutting it in half. And Rasulullah says, لا تصلوا علي الصلاة البتراء When you send your peace upon me, don't cut it in half. He told him, how? How do we cut it in half? He said, when you send your peace and blessings upon me, send your peace and blessings upon my family as well. Incidentally, I remember once watching a satellite channel and there was a scholar with, with the Sophia and the long beard and all that, obviously not from our school of thought. And what caught my attention is that he was reciting this hadith, لا تصلوا علي الصلاة البتراء. And this is exactly how he said it. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تصلوا علي الصلاة البتراء. The Prophet, peace be upon him only, said, don't send the, send the half salah on me. فَقَالُوا لَهُ وَكَيْفَ ذَلِكَ فَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ لَا تُصَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَصَلُّوا عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ He's reciting the hadith and he keeps on saying, صلى الله عليه وسلم. I don't know what it's, what does the word alim cost? What does it cost? Does it cost money? Does it cost his breath? What is it? And in another hadith by Imam al-Wadha, مَنْ لَمْ يَقْدَرْ عَلَىٰ مَا يُكَفِّرْ بِهِ ذُنُوبَهُ فَلْيُكْثِرْ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدْ فَإِنَّهَا تَهْدِمُ الذُّنُوبُ See, when you send your peace and blessings upon Rasulullah and his family, you not just receive a reward, but your sins are being forgiven. That forgives your sins as well. This is one. This is one deed that makes the scale heavier. And the second is Husnul Khulu. Good temper. Having a good temper. With your family members, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your family and friends. Having a good temper. Not being ill tempered. Having a good temper, this will make your scale heavier. One day, a Sayyid al Burujurdi, a Sayyid al Burujurdi was one of our top scholars who lived in Qom, one of our greatest Malaj. A Sayyid al Burujurdi made a vow, made a nidh, that if he ever gets angry, he will fast for an entire year. You want to discipline yourself? This is how you discipline yourself. If he gets angry once, he will fast for an entire year. If this was the case with us, we'd be fasting all year long. <laughs> it's very difficult to control your anger. This is something very hard. So they say one day in class, Sayyid al-Burujudi was a merja and he teaches. One day in class, one of his students kept on debating him. He kept on refuting his argument, but the student was a bit, and I've seen students like that, they keep on in insisting on their opinion. So I say to the Buddha, tell them, Baba, just go and read the book and you'll understand what I'm saying. Do you call this getting mad? Do you call this getting angry? Because of this incident, I say to the Buddha, he fasted for an entire year. Because he thought perhaps while he was refuting his student, perhaps he got angry. This is akhlaq. This is akhlaq. And you know, one of the reasons why I mention stories by our scholars 
and not our Imams. Our Imams, we have the best Imams and we have the greatest Imams. But some of you, they told me, say, our Imams are way too high. We can't be like our Imams. Look, what about the scholars? Our scholars are normal human beings. They're fallible, they're not infallible. They perform sins, and we can become like them. They also say that as Shaykh Nasir Din al Tusi, also called Al Muhaddaq al Tusi, one day, someone that was jealous of him, someone that hated him, wrote him a letter calling him a dog. Called the Sheikh, called the scholar a dog, and called him a kid. Sheikh al Tusi wrote back a letter to him saying, I'm sorry, but um, I'm not a dog. A dog has four legs, I just have two legs. A dog barks, I speak. And he wrote a whole letter showing the difference between a human being and a dog. <laughs> this is how you control him. This is called Hussan al khuluq And this is very hard. Honestly, this is very hard. One day, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was with his companion, Qamba. Qambar, everyone knows Qambar. Qambar was one of the servants, was a servant for Imam Ali. He would bring him his food. He would put his shoes in front of him. He would, do sh he would go shopping for Imam Ali. Qambar. Incidentally, the story just came to my mind. I, just, I have this bad tendency to say stories within stories. There was a scholar by the name of Ibn Sakit during the days of Al Mutawakkil al Abbasi. The Mutawakkil was one of the Abbasi Khulafa. Ibn Sakit was a scholar of the Arabic language. Al Mutawakkil, no, I'm sorry, during the days of Harun. During the days of Harun al Rashid. Al Mutawakkil, uh, I'm sorry, Harun asked Ibn Sakit to, to teach his two sons. Harun asked Ibn Sakit to teach Harun's two children, Al Amin and Al Ma'mun. Ibn Sakit would go to Harun's palace to teach Al Amin wal Ma'mun. One day, Harun was, wasn't just a dictator, wasn't just a murderer, wasn't just a thief, but he was arrogant. He was arrogant. One day, he asks Ibn Sakit. Ibn Sakit was a Shi'i. He was a follower of Ahl Bayt. And Harun was an enemy of Ahl Bayt. One day, he asks Ibn Sakit, he tells him, are my children, my two boys, Al Amin wal Ma'mun, are they better or Al Hassan wal Hussein, the sons of Ali bin Abi Talib? Al Sakit, Ibn Sakit, are you kidding me? You're asking me if Al Hassan wal Hussein, your two children, are they greater than Al Hassan wal Hussein? Qamba, Khadim Amir al Mu'minin, is greater than not only your children, but greater than you. Harun <laughs> ordered for Ibn Sakit's tongue to be cut off. They cut his tongue off and he bled it to them. We come back to Qambar. One day, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam saw Qambar. Qambar was walking with him. Someone trashed Qambar. Someone cursed Qambar in the presence of Amir al Amir al Mu'mineen noticed Qambar got upset. His face got red. He got upset. He was about to say something back. Amir al Mu'mineen stopped him. He said, Listen. Ya Qambar. He said, leave him, just ignore him. By ignoring him, you will please Allah and you will displease Shaytan. And you'll be punishing this way. See, sometimes we have enemies. The best way to get back at your enemy and seek revenge from your enemy is to not say anything at all. Silence. فَوَالَّذِي فَلَقَ الْحَبَّ وَبَرَأَ النَّسَمَ مَا أَرْضَ الْمُؤْنَمْ رَبَّهُ بِمِثْلِ الْحَلْمِ Imam Ali swears that nothing pleases Allah more than tolerance and patience. وَلَا أَسْخَطَ الشَّيْطَانِ بِمِثْلِ الصَّمْتِ You want to hurt shaytan? You want to get him angry? Remain quiet. وَلَا عُوْقِبَ الْأَحْمَقْ بِمِثْلِ السُّكُوتِ عَنْهِ and if you have someone that you'd like to punish, someone that hurts you, hurts your feelings and insult you and insults you, the best way is to remain silent, believe me. Believe me, silence is the best punishment. As Khaliji say, Khalijis have a nice saying, they say, Al Hagran al Musran. You want to punish someone? Ignore them. 
and it's a punishment. صلى على محمد وعلى محمد. I remember one time, about two years ago, we were sitting having dinner with my father, and we were watching TV. Sometimes we watch TV during dinner. I remember someone came on national national TV live. This was live national TV. He came on and he started attacking my father. Saying that his tafsir of the Quran is full of mistakes. His recitation of the verses is full of mistakes. And so on and so forth. I remember I looked at my father and my father was smiling. Of course, I was burning inside. I personally I was burning inside. I felt like breaking the TV. My father remained quiet. Of course, we were having dinner. I lost my appetite. I could no longer eat. But my father continued eating. He continued, he smiled, and it's as if he didn't hear, hear a word. When he finished, we turned off the TV, obviously. He said, if what he was saying was true, may Allah forgive me. And if what he was saying was false, may Allah forgive me. This is very hard. In positions like this, live on TV, millions of people are watching and someone attacks you. This is hard. This is extremely hard. We get upset if someone makes a, a wrong statement or a negative statement about us on Facebook. If some one person, we get upset. Imagine if billions of people do. Husnul Khulub. Husnul Khulub. Having a good temper. There's nothing like having a good temper. And it makes our scale on the Day of Judgment a lot heavier. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The third obstacle, Mawqaf al hisab being judged. See, there's a scale in which our good deeds and bad deeds will be put on a scale. And then there's no, there's judgment. Allah will have us judged by the angels one by one. Question, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? What was this act? What was that act? What was this glance? What was that glance? One by one. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الدُّنْيَا فِي حَلَالِهَا حِسَابٌ وَفِي حَرَامِهَا عِقَابٌ وَفِي الشُّبُهَاتِ عِتَابٌ Imam Al-Hasan says, Know that even the things that we do in this life that are halal will be questioned. And will be asked. And as for the haram things, we will be punished. And as for the things that we don't know, are they halal, are they haram, we're not sure, we'll be scolded. We'll be scolded. And what is the first thing that will be judged about, brothers and sisters? What is the first thing that they will ask us about? As-salam. Imam al-Baqir says, أول ما يحاسب به العبد As-salam فإن قبلت قبل ما سواها وإن ردت رد ما سواها The salah is the first thing that will be asked about. First thing, what was your salah? Did you pray? Did you not pray? Did you pray on time? How was your salah? Did you have wudu? Did you concentrate in your salah? Or was your mind somewhere else? Some people, when they pray, sometimes including myself, our mind wanders everywhere except salah. And this is a problem. Do we concentrate in our salah or not? Some people say that I, I can't concentrate in my salah. I can't, no matter how much I try, I can't focus and concentrate on my salah. You know why? There's a reason for it. There's a reason why we're not concentrating in our salah. I'll give you an example. Have you seen children when they watch cartoons? You've seen that? Have you ever had a child come and complain that he can't concentrate watching Tom and Jerry? Have you seen a, a child ever concert, complain about that? Then when he's watching SpongeBob SquarePants, he can't concentrate? Of course not. When children watch cartoons, they stick to the TV. My, my little son, if a bomb explodes, he won't realize it. When he's watching cartoons. They're so glued to the TV, nothing can distract them. Why? Because they like it. Because they enjoy it. For them, this is fun. This is interesting. They like it. Unfortunately, when we're not concentrating on our salah, 
It's because we're not liking it. It's because we're doing it to get it over with. When you're talking to a friend, to a dear friend, and you're engaged in a conversation, do you concentrate on that conversation or not? If you like that person and you like that conversation, obviously, you'll pay attention. But if you don't, you won't. It's the same thing with ourselves. Amir al-Mumin says, وَعْلَمُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَائِنُكُمْ عَنِ الصَّغِيرِ مِنْ عَمَلِكُمْ وَالْكَبِيرِ All people know that Allah will ask you about the small, from the biggest to the smallest things will be asked. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? The fourth obstacle, passing out our books. Every person will receive a book and that book will have our actions, all of our actions. You might say, well, how big is this book? It should be hundreds of volumes. Not necessarily. Right now, don't you get... Um, on a CD, you put so much information. Or there's so much technology now that you put so much technology, uh, so much information on small pieces of devices. This is very possible. Allah will hand us our books. They're called books. So what will they look like? We don't know. But it will have all of our actions. For those that are good, they will receive their books in their right hand. And those that are bad, they will receive their books in their left hand, but not like this. Not like this. The Quran says they will receive their books from, the, from behind their backs. In the left hand, but from behind their backs. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابُهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ and on that day we will remember, we will read this book and we will be shocked. Oh my God. This was recorded. That glance was recorded. This statement was recorded. That thing that I did was recorded. Everything will, will be recorded. That is why on the Day of Judgment we, will, we shall all say, يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَادَ الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادُرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَى وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam had servants at his house and for every servant he had a book. If they ever misbehaved, if they ever didn't obey him, they disobeyed him, whatever it is that they did, he would write it in a book. For every servant, every servant had a book, he would write it in that book. Once a month he would collect all of his servants and he would pass out those books to them. They would read those books and they would feel very shy. They would feel very embarrassed. Once he would do that, he would say, let Allah be my witness that I forgive all of you. If you ever disobeyed me, I forgive all of you. And now I want all of you to ask Allah to forget to forgive Ali ibn al Hussein Zayn al -Mahdi. We shall all receive our books. And finally, the fourth obstacle of the Day of Judgment right before heaven and hell is the bridge. There's a bridge. There's a bridge that we have to cross over. Those that want to enter heaven they have to cross a bridge, but what's underneath that bridge? Hellfire. If you can imagine this in your mind, heaven is kind of like on a hill, and you have to pass a bridge in order to get to that hill, but underneath that bridge, there's hellfire. Thus, every human being has to cross over hellfire in order to get to heaven. Why is this? What's the philosophy? Why can't we just enter a door and see heaven? Just enter heaven without... Going through this mess. Why do we have to see how far? Uh, Allah wants us to be grateful for heaven. In case you doubted hellfire, in case you thought that everyone's going to end up in heaven, no, my dear friends, there's a hellfire. Even if you go to heaven, you still have to see hellfire. You see what's happening in hellfire. Who's burning there? Everyone has to cross that bridge and see hellfire. In order to become, in order to have a more a greater appreciation of heaven. Now this bridge, this bridge, some people will 
run. Some people will run over this bridge in Etem. Other people won't run, they'll jog. Others will walk. Some people will stumble. Others will crawl. And some people won't even make it across, they'll fall into Etem. I ask Allah to allow us to run over that bridge. Speaking of running, again this year in Hajj, we had a friend in our group. Um, he was a bit overweight. Well, not a bit, just a, a bit too much overweight. And he had a difficulty doing his tawaf and doing his sa'i. I remember he remained in his, in his ihram for about three or four days because he just couldn't walk around the Kaaba. And sa'i was even more difficult for him, going around Safa and Marwa. He needed a wheelchair. Khalas, we bought him a wheelchair and someone pushed him in between Safa and Marwa. The day that we were leaving, at the airport, when we went to the counter, Middle East Airlines, we were going to Beirut, Middle East Airlines told us that there's no assigned seating. It's free seating. Whoever comes first gets the best seats. Now, of course, including first class. So whoever goes first gets to sit in first class. You should see this guy. This man started running like a horse. <laughs> I swear to God. He couldn't perform sa'i in between Safa and Marwa. He needed a wheelchair. But for first class, he could run like a horse. <laughs> and some people told him they brought it to his attention. Thus, inshallah, we'll be running over that bridge. What helps us, just very briefly, what helps us in passing the bridge? Two things. Salat al-Rahim. Salat al-Rahim. I don't need to talk about this. Having a good relationship with your family members. Calling them once in a while. Visiting them. Staying close to your family members. In one hadith, and I've mentioned this before, that if a person was destined to live for three days, but because of Salat al-Rahim, he will live for 30 years. And if a person was destined for 30 years, if he cuts off his rahim, if he cuts off his ties with his family members, he will live for three days. Salat al-Rahim. And number two, Adah al-Amana. If you're trusted with Amana, if you're trusted with something, give it back. Don't pretend like no one gave you anything. If someone trusts you with wealth, with money, with a car, with a house, with a book, whatever it is, give it back. Adah al-Amana. Or someone, for example, if you're going to Iraq and someone tells you, I want you to go, there's money for the orphans, for a hospital, for a project, for a school, take it with you. You go and you give it. You give it to the right person. This will also help on the day of the day. Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, and listen to this. Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam says that if Shimr ibn al Joshan, before killing my father, had trusted me with his sword, and before killing my father, he asked for his sword back, I would have given it back to him. I would give it back to him. This is Adat al Amana. Adat al Amana is important. There was a man during the days of Al Mutawakkil al Abbasi, he would stand on the border of the city of Karbala. His job was to harass and hurt and even kill the visitors of Imam Hussein. He would stop them, he would stop the caravans, he would kill some of them, he would cut off their hands, he would cut off their feet, and so on and so forth. One time this man fell asleep. When he fell asleep, a caravan coming to Karbala, entering Karbala, passed by and he was asleep. So they were saved. When they were going in the desert, of course, it's all sand. Some of this sand that they created came onto his body. This man, in his dream, he was sleeping. In his dream, he saw that it was the day of judgment. Everyone standing for Hassan to be judged. When it was his turn to be judged, the angel said, take him and throw him into hellfire. This person is a bad person. This person is a murderer. Throw him into hellfire. 
He says, as they were dragging me in chains, throwing me into hellfire, all of a sudden, someone said, wait, 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 stop, stop. <coughs> I wanted to see who, who was stopping them. I looked and it was none other than he said, the man that stopped me, stopped the angels from taking me to hellfire was Imam Hussein. He said, don't take him into hellfire. I said, subhanAllah, out of all the people, he's stopping me? He's not allowing you to throw me into hellfire? He said, yes. What is the reason? He said, because as the caravan, as the caravan for my visitors were coming to Kalbada, some of the sand that rose out of the desert, it lied on his body. Because of the sand that lied on his body, he's not going to enter hell. And he was not put into hell. He woke up from his dream, he saw traces of a caravan going to Kalbada, and he saw that there is sand all over him. When he woke up, he started reciting this verse of poetry. This night is dedicated for the Ansar, for the companions of Imam Hussein. On the night of Ashura, Imam Hussein stood to speak. He showed the companions their place in paradise. First, Imam Hussein turned off the candles and he told his companions that it's at night, it's dark. Those of you that wish to leave, you may leave. He turned off the candles. After a while, he turned back the candles on and he saw that all of his companions remained seated. None of them left. He said, let me tell you, for those of you that will remain with me tomorrow, all of you will be killed. All of you will be martyred. And all of you will become shuhada. Zuhair ibn al-Qain stood up. He said, my dear master, if they kill us and they cut our bodies into pieces and they burn our bodies and they scatter the ash and they give us back life again and they do this to us 70 times by God who will not abandon you, Ya Abba. <coughs> this, is, this was Zuhair ibn al-Qain. And there were so many like Zuhair ibn al-Qain, Habib ibn Mubahir, Muslim ibn Awsaja. When Habib ibn Mubahir entered the battlefield, Habib ibn, Habib ibn Mubahir was over 90 years old. He was one of the companions of Rasulullah. He was a mujtahid, a scholar. He would recite the entire Quran every single night. Habib ibn Mubahir entered the battlefield. He fought bravely until he fell. He fell to the ground. He called for his companions. Muslim ibn Awsaja goes over the body of Habib ibn Mubahir. He told him, Ya Habib, is there anything I could do for you? If you have a will, give me your last will. Even though moments from now, I will have the same fate as you. Habib ibn Mubahir said, I only have one will. I don't have any other wish. My only wish is to protect this man. And he pointed at Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Habib ibn Mubahir went, Muslim ibn Awsaja went. One of the companions of Imam Hussein was a young man by the name of Wahab. Wahab was a Christian that converted into Islam. He came from Turkey, from Istanbul. He came on the day of Ashura. 
and fought with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and he had recently gone and married. On the day of Ashura, his mother comes to him and she says, Ya Wahab, do you see other, the other companions? They're entering the battlefield, they're risking their lives, they're giving, they're sacrificing their lives. You also have to enter. Wahab was preparing for battle, his wife comes to him, she tells him, Ya Wahab, we just got married. We're still newlyweds. This is supposed to be our honeymoon. Don't go and die in our honeymoon. Wahab doesn't listen to her. He says his farewell and he enters the battlefield. He begins fighting. All of a sudden he hears his wife calling him. He goes back to the camp. He says, what do you need? She said, Ya Wahab, I have one request from you. My request is you enter the battlefield and you fight until you die, until they kill you. He said, SubhanAllah, a moment, just moments ago, you were telling me not to enter the battlefield, not to go, not to die. She said, Ya Wahab, don't blame me. But the sound of Imam Hussein shouting, Allah hal min nasirin yansuruna, Allah hal min dhabbin yadubbu an haram rasulillah. These shouts are killing me, Ya Wahab. Wahab enters the battlefield and he begins to fight until he dies. Another one of the companions of Imam Hussein was a 10 year old boy that even Ashab al-Maqatil, they don't even mention his name. All they say, غُلَامٌ قُتِلَ أَبُوهُ فِي الْمَعْرَكَةِ A young man whom his father was killed earlier that day. This young man comes to Imam Hussein. He was so small, he was so young, that his sword would drag on the ground. He came to Imam Hussein seeking permission to enter the battlefield. Imam Hussein said, no, I don't give you permission. Why? He said, because your mother this morning, she already lost your father. I don't want her to lose a mother and a father, to lose her husband and her son on the same day. And the young man began to cry. He said, Ya, ya, ya Aba Abdullah, it is my mother who told me to enter the battlefield. My mother told me to come and seek permission from you. And Abu Hussein didn't give him permission. His mother came holding his hand. She came to Imam Hussein, she told him, Ya Aba Abdullah, La tudkalu bika ummuka zahra, wa la udkalu bi waladi. Your mother Fatima will sit and mourn you, and I will not sit and mourn my mother. Let me be proud of my son the same way your mother Fatima is proud of you. Imam Hussein gives him permission, he enters the battlefield and he begins to recite, Amiri Husaynun wa ni'man Amir. Amiri Husaynun wa ni'mal amir Sururu Fuad al-Bashir al-Nadir Aliyun wa Fatimatun wa Alida' Fahal ta'lamun alahu min nadir when he fell on the ground, he called, As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam Hussein sends his son Ali al-Akbar to rush to this young man. He sat next to him. He brushed the blood and dust off his face. He told him, is there anything I can do for you? He said, yes, ya ibn Rasulillah. Anqulu rahla ummi ila rihalikum. My mother will be lonely tonight, my master. Make sure that she doesn't sleep alone in her tent. Have her moved to your tent. Shubban, Shubban, مثل الورد يزهون. حساف, حساف على الغبر ينامون. يا شبان يا يا بالغلات والنون. تصدعون قلبي من تلوجون ما ادري بعده ليش تريدون الحر was also among one of the companions of Imam Hussein that died on the day of Ashura as he stood in the middle of the battlefield I told you this he says he told his companions أرى نفسي مخيرة بين الجنة والنار والله لن أختار على الجنة شيئا he said, I will never choose anything over paradise. He headed to, he headed to the camp of Imam Hussein. As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam says, wa alayka as-salam, who are you? He said, ana alladhi ja'ja'atu bika an al-tariq. I was the one that brought you to this place, my dear master. Hal tara li min tawbah. Do you think that Allah will forgive me? The Imam tells him, in tawbah, faqad taab Allahu alayk. Come, sit with us. 
Then he says, no, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I was the first person that stood in, in your face. Allow me to be the first person that dies in your hands. And the Imam gives him permission, he enters the battlefield. Inni ana al-hur wa ma'wa al-dayfi, adhrubukum bil-sayf. Adhrubu fi a'naqikum bil-sayfi, an khayri man halla bi-ardin. Khayfi, adhrubukum wala ara min hayfi. Al-hur ibn Yazid fights until he's injured, he falls on the ground. He calls Imam Hussain. Aba Abdullah rushes to him, he sits next to him. He sits right next to his body and he tells him, ما أخطأت حينما سلمتك أمك حرة أنت حر في الدنيا والآخرة. You are your mother was not mistaken when she called you a free man. You are free in this life and in the next. After after the battle of the day of Ashura, Al Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi was the first person to be buried by his family, by his tribe, by his Ashira. They came to him and they buried him. The poet here says. العشيرة العشيرة شالت بحر الضيرة العشيرة شالت بحر الضيرة الكل منهم الكل واحد منهم عليه شالت الغيرة بس ظلوا ما عدهم عشيرة ضحايا بالشمس من غير تنسيه أو حسين Tis flow for your tragedy. If I could just kindly of ask you one more time, if you are leaving, please be quiet. And if you are still in the middle of the five minutes, can you tell me? Just five minutes, inshallah. Oh, Oh, 